And we are live. I want to say happy, <coughs> happy coughing, happy uh, World Whiskey Day uh, to everyone in the chat. Let me do a roll call real quick, and then I'll talk about what I want to do this evening. Uh, Tom R., thank you very much for joining in. Donner Pass Whiskey, thank you very much for tuning in. Whiskey Music, thank you very much for tuning in. And hope we're going to get a lot more people uh, in the house shortly. Uh, Roslav Traps, thank you very much for uh, tuning in. Uh, Edwin Esparza, thank you very much for uh, tuning in. Alrighty, uh, all right, I'll keep an eye on everything. So, um, uh, what I'm doing this evening in terms of what I'm drinking is I've got two boxes of samples of Texas whiskeys. Uh, these are from uh, Matt, the Whiskey Crusaders. Hopefully, he will join in. William Devilar, thank you very much for uh, tuning in. Uh, so, um, Matt, we met. I met up with Matt uh, at uh, Iron Root Republic Distillery when I was down there in Texas, and he graciously gave me these two boxes. Andrew Spruell, thank you very much for uh, tuning in. He gave me these two boxes. There's 20 samples in here. Uh, I took three of them out. There's three samples that I took out. Uh, Doug Crisop, thank you very much for tuning in. <coughs> I took three of them out that are from Andalusia, um, and they are sitting over here. So Matt is going to join me next Friday. We're going to do a live stream. So I'll have Matt here on the program, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, Texas whiskey, and we will review some Andalusia together. Moose66, thank you very much for tuning in. So I've got another 17 samples in here. Um, the challenge is going to be with these whiskeys is uh, Matt's handwriting. Matt has the handwriting of a medical doctor. Zach Andrews, thank you very much for tuning in. Thomas Buck, thank you very much for tuning in. So it's a little challenging to read the labels on these. Uh, I'm not going to drink all 17 of these. I've got three Glen Cairns out here. I will do, I'll grab three randomly. I've also set one aside from uh, one other distillery that also has some widely di distribution. I want to do that. I'm actually going to pick up a full bottle of that later on uh, and do a, re a review of that one. Uh, Craig McBee, thank you very much for tuning in. Zach Andrews, thank you very much for tuning in. So, yeah, so I've heard a lot of good things about Andalusia. Um, some of the others have done re reviews of them. Uh, I think um, uh, Josh from Cast Strength has actually visited them. So that's why I really want to set those aside um, and, and, and go over those uh, with uh, Matt. So I'll talk a little bit about World Whiskey Day. Last year we had a real big thing of Whiskey Day. It was sort of a marathon, starting in the morning, went all day long, went late into the evening. <coughs> uh, Tom R. says, maybe the more you drink, the easier it will be to read his handwriting. I kind of doubt that. Uh, but, uh, hey, Carl, uh, Nate Shaman, thank you very much for tuning in. Anyway, he says, no drunk fest tonight. There goes the show. Well, it just all depends on that. Well, what it takes to get me drunk uh, or how big these samples are. Uh, the samples are pretty good size, and I've already pulled one out. Oh, 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 oh. If I can read his handwriting. So this first one I pulled out, uh, I don't know if, if you can read that. This is Ben Milan, small batch straight rye, 42 point something percent. 40, excuse me, 45.2 percent. I was hoping he would join in, so, so I may make any errors again. So Ben Milan, if I recall correctly, the uh, head dis or one of the main people there is uh, Heather Green. Heather Green. In fact, I just watched a, a video uh, with her on it, done by Epicurus. It was really well done. So Heather Green has written a book called Whiskey Distilled. Uh, you can also get another copy version of this book. It's got her picture on it. Uh, so she was a whiskey sommelier in New York. She has moved to Texas. Uh, she's now in um, – my brain just went blank. Austin, Texas. And she's now working as part of a team with a couple other women at uh, Ben Milan, if I recall correctly. Let me Google that real quick. I'm going to search that real quick. And then I'm going to read something um, on uh, – let me get World Whiskey Day and we'll get into that one. Hold on. So World Whiskey Day was founded in 2012 and falls on the third Saturday of May each year. So there is an International Whiskey Day, and there's a World Whiskey Day. International Whiskey Day was back in March, and it fell this year it fell on a Wednesday. Uh, World Whiskey Day 
thankfully it falls on a Saturday, which makes it a little bit easier for whiskey tubers that we can do something. You don't have to worry about getting up in the morning and going to work. Uh, Mark Tudor, thank you much for turning in. Uh, Donner Pass uh, Whiskey says, last year was a good day. I returned home late evening after scoring my first uh, Elijah Craig Bear Proof and Stag Jr. and watched whiskey tubers all day long. Yeah, it was really, really cool. Uh, however, uh, you get, most of you guys probably know Scott and Bart and Scott's just dummies are actually over in Scotland hanging out with Roy. So they're running around. And, of course, there's a there's a time difference. So they're running around Scotland. And I hope they're having an absolutely fantastic time. Funny thing is they've got sunshine over there, and it's actually cold and rainy here in California. You uh, know I'm wearing a sweatshirt, and it's been raining off and on. We're going to get rain and off and on for the last uh, for the next week. And it's about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, which is not super cold, but uh, for this time of year, it's cold for California. Uh, James McGowan, thank you much for uh, tuning in. All right, so um, World Whiskey Day was founded in 2012. Falls on the third day of each year. World Whiskey Day was founded by Blair Bowman while studying at the University of Aberdeen. Aberdeen is on the sort of north uh, western side of Scotland. It is now owned by White Light Media of Edinburgh, and in 2017, employed two officially w official whiskey ambassadors. <coughs> so now that a day is owned and the title is owned, that means you can't make World Whiskey Day t-shirts, hats, and bumper stickers because now they own it. Whatever. Anyway, it's Ben Milan, small batch, straight rye, 45.2%. I will pour two thirds of it in there. Um, it is now owned. Okay, I already said that. And so there are two ambassadors for it: Ali Mathers and Joe Kent, who will be championing all things whiskey in the run up to World Whiskey Day, twentieth of May. Participants are encouraged to drink whiskey on the day at events which may be officially registered on the World Day website. Other participants via social media using. Hashtag World Whiskey Day, whatever. All righty. So what was the purpose of it? Why did they start it? I don't know. Just to promote the business. Uh, the difference is International Whiskey Day was founded in order to commemorate the life of um, Scottish writer, whiskey writer Michael Jackson, not the singer, uh, who uh, died from complications related to Parkinson's. So the very beginning of International Whiskey Day was actually uh, as a fundraiser uh, for that uh, that disease. And so I, I think International Whiskey Day has a little bit more of a, an, uh, um, what would you say, uh, philanthropic uh, uh, gist to it rather than just pure business, which I, I kind of appreciate that. Uh, Moses Chun, thank you very much for uh, tuning in. So the first one I have here is a rye. I'm not going to start drinking one and then go to the next. I'm going to pour three because I want to choose which direction I'm going to go with these based on um, what kind of whiskey it is and the alcohol level. I'm going to start with the lowest and then go to the highest. If one uh, may be more intense, I want to finish with that one rather than starting with one. Anyway, so Ben Milan, I'm going to look up that look up this a little bit real quick. So I didn't look these up. I'm sort of doing these blind. I don't know what's on the labels. Um, fairly certain. Okay, it's Ben Millam. Uh, it's his handwriting. It's his handwriting. So it's not Ben Milan. It's Ben Millam. The N looks like an M. So B E N M I L A M Whiskey Distillery. And I was right. So Heather Green is now working there. Uh, whiskey sommelier. She's not working there. The next time I go down there, if I'm in the area, I definitely want to check out the distillery, and I would love to have her on this program. I've sent her emails. Other people sent her emails. She's a busy lady. She's a busy lady, but I would absolutely love to have her on and be able to talk to her. By the way, and if you haven't read this book, really, really, really good. I would say this book is good for several different reasons. One, it is somewhat introductory, so if you're new to whiskey, it has that benefit. But there are enough, I would say, deeper nuggets in there to be good for the person who's been to whiskey for a while. And stylistically, I like the way it's written. I like, I can read two books 
that have basically the same informational content and yet one can be written better and I'll enjoy the other one more than the other. Anyway, so uh, Heather Green, she's now at Ben Millum. Ben Millum. All right, I'm going to pull another one out of here. I want to get something different. I'm going to try something different. I uh, got box one, box two. I'm going to pull over here, box two. This is, I cannot read the handwriting on this one. Uh, <laughs> Matt, if you, if you looks like W I I can't freaking read this. W I R or V H E R S P A O U N. I don't know. I, I have no idea. But it's a straight bourbon. Something, something, something. 50. I, I can't freaking read this. Matt, where are you? I'm going to text. I'm going to send Matt a text. See if I can get him to uh, join me. Um, Sorry. I should have done this before. Sorry. I I apologize. Santa Cruz, and thank you very much for tuning in. I cannot read his handwriting, so we're going to take a guess. I'm I'm going to see if I can see if Google can help me out. Let's see what we can do here. Uh, w I. I'm going to guess that's an R or a V. Uh, R H E R. I don't know S. P O U N Distillery. Sometimes, if you get it close, it'll find it for you. Yeah, Witherspoon. Okay. Hey, Mark. Hey, thank you very much for the three ninety nine, Mark Tudor. Thank you very much. All right. So it's Witherspoon. Witherspoon. Witherspoon Distillery, located in Louisville or Louisville, Texas. All right. So this is Witherspoon Straight Bourbon, Part C three, I think. Uh, so this is a bourbon. So this one's a rye. This one's a bourbon. Witherspoon Distillery. Use a magnifying glass on your phone. It ain't gonna. It's not the. It trust me. It's not. It's not my eyes. It's his handwriting. Uh, by the way. Oh, so uh, Bill, the whiskey dick. He did a live stream last night. I didn't join the live stream, but I watched the whole stream this morning. Uh, I, um, watched and listened to it. And he had also some samples from Matt. And he had the same complaint that Matt uh, has uh, very bad handwriting. Anyway, so Witherspoon Distillery in Louisville, Texas. All right, cool. I, so this is a, a rye. This one's a bourbon. I would really like to have a straight, uh, have a, uh, uh, a, a single malt. This is a wheat whiskey. I'm going to put that one back. I want a single malt. Single barrel bourbon. Uh, my guess is... There's probably, what the hell is that? Yellow Rose Outlaw Bourbon. There's probably more bourbons due to the climate. Rye and something. Rye and rum. Four grains. Oh, 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 okay. Four grain bourbon. And that's what. Single malt. Here we go. All right, all right, all right. I wanted a single malt. I want a single malt. So this is Herman Marshall Temptress. Single malt, 46% ABV. I'm going to double check on that one. This is Herman Marshall. And they are, it looks like in Dallas, in Dallas. And now I'm getting, hey. <laughs> so, Matt, so Crusade, Whiskey Crusaders, I'm presumably Matt. Uh, I'd say, Matt, your handwriting sucks. If you're not a medical doctor, there's no excuse. Your handwriting sucks. I'm having a hard time reading these. <laughs> uh, you, you can get a template for your printer and print these out. <laughs> anyway, so I got a Herman Marshall Temptress Single Malt. Seven, I can't read the rest of it. it looks like 46% alcohol by volume. I'm going to start with that one. 
I'm going to start with a single malt. Ooh, it looks pretty light. I'm going to start with a single malt, and then I'm going to go to the bourbon, and then I'm going to go to the rye. I think the rye is going to have the most intense flavors. I'm guessing just based on style, um, unless they did a peated. Um, and that's why I want to go that direction. Also, this one's 46. This one's 54. So that's a big boy. And this is 45. So typically you want to go lower alcohol to higher alcohol because the lower alcohol will seem tame if you're going back down the direction. <laughs> and, uh, he says he's sorry. He's at a party where he's at right now. It's okay. Hope you're having a world whiskey day party. However, so you have to make a choice between are you going to give preference to the potentially more flavor intense on your palate or are you going to go towards uh, because of the grains and style it is or are you going to go with the alcohol uh, level? I'm going to guess, this is guess, educated guess, that a rye would be more intense, kind of like a peated scotch. And if you're going to do scotches and you had a, a, a unpeated lowland, you had a sherried, Highland, and then you had an Isla peated. You would start with the lowland, go to the Highland, and then finish with the peat. Because once you go peat, it's kind of hard to go back uh, the other direction. So I'm going to do the same thing, even though this bourbon is at a slightly, slightly higher ABV. If I had some water, if I was smart and was thinking, uh, I would have some water in between. Stand by for one second. Sorry for the lack of preparation. I'm going to give me some water. Give me two seconds. Talk amongst yourselves. Hold on. All right, now I got some water. So, um, you know, if you look at the size of Texas on a map, Texas is just huge. Um, I don't know how many distilleries there are um, exactly. I think there's currently around 21 on the uh, Texas Whiskey Trail at last count, but uh, there's not all the distilleries in Texas are going uh, currently on the trail, and not all the distillers are necessarily producing whiskey. They're producing gin and other things as well. Uh, <laughs> Tom says, I think you demonetize with your singing. If I was singing a particular song, I, I might. Um, they're getting kind of draconian. Even if you're doing a cover of a song, you can get a hit on that one. So uh, if you look at the size of Texas in comparison in relation to how many distilleries there are, they are really, really in their beginning days. Spencer, oh, Spencer, hey, Spencer's in the house. So the uh, CEO of the Texas Whiskey Association um, and the trail uh, is in the house, 15 on the trail and, and growing. Okay. So, Spencer, th now that you're in the house, do you know ballpark figure how many distilleries that are producing whiskey are in Texas? So, currently in Scotland, there's 128 distilleries. Only 81 out of the 128 in Scotland are open to the public. Um, and there are two distilleries that are pending. One is still being sort of built. Um, and the other one is being revived. It's those are 130 distilleries. Okay, so so okay. Here's the funny thing. So if you consider, I and mean, if you didn't see the video, uh, there's so there's 130 distilleries, which is only two more than Scotland. And actually, Scotland will be hitting 130 once these other two distilleries are completely open. Uh, so Texas is this big. Let's say this is a map. Scotland would only be like this big on the map. So if you consider the if you know Texas is this big, Scotland will fit in it like this big, right? So if you consider the ratio, and not all are producing whiskey, correct, correct, yeah. So then you have to go back and look. Okay, they have to look back and look at the profiles and which are producing uh, whiskey. So for example, in Scotland, out of the 128 distilleries, if I recall correctly, I think there's like 13 grain distilleries, and none of those are open to the public. And some of the distilleries in Scotland. Uh, don't produce that aren't open to the public. Don't bottle anything. They produce a whiskey that is then goes into blends. So uh, Matt just asked, "What did I uh, whiskey that I pull out?" This is the Herman Marshall Temptress Single Malt. This is the Weatherspoon Straight Bourbon Whiskey, 
And this is the Ben Millum uh, small back straight rye. And I'm going to be going this way. So color-wise, looks pretty light. What I am actually most interested in coming out of Texas is to see what they do with uh, single malt. Ooh. Um, what I'm concerned about is, so I have a bottle of, okay, here we go. I have a bottle of Lot 40 cast strength from uh, Canada. This is not available here in the United States. Uh, this is the best Canadian whiskey you can probably get. <coughs> and Roy Aquavite said sort of the same thing. He was when he tried this after the love, after spectacular is this sets such a high bar that you kind of wonder once you've had this, anything else you're going downhill and nothing else coming out of Canada is anything close. So the, but they've shown what Canada can do if they would get their act together um, and do something really, 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 really good. Uh, some a couple elves up in uh, humorous elves up in Canada sent this to me. Uh, I'm gonna do a Canada month one of these days, might not be till next fall, maybe uh, next winter time. I won't get into that this time. So, what my thoughts are, and I've been thinking about this, and who knows, we're still early. Um, where is Texas going? I mean, right now, I've been all jazzed up on Texas, but and Balcona's is just absolutely phenomenal. Iron Root, absolutely phenomenal. And I really like uh, Garrison Brothers. Although uh, Dustin Silva, um, D8 Silva 2, apparently he got a bad bottle. We've been discussing it. Um, is if you, you can have such a fantastic distillery, such as Balcones, it's so awesome that you can sort of hope to generalize and say, wow, if this is Texas, I want to get more into Texas, but are the others going to be able to, I don't want the word compete, but be comparable in quality. Not that they taste like them, comparable in quality. And that's a challenge. Wow. So go ahead, says, uh, start with a Canada week. I'll do a whole month of Canada. I haven't got a plan out yet. So I actually contacted uh, several of uh, our Canadian whiskey tubers i asked them for a like a top 10 list so they've all given me top 10 lists which there's a lot of overlap between the lists so now i have a general idea you know i'm sampling several you know whiskey tubers up there what do you think is a top 10 canadian whiskeys they sent me their lists there's a lot of uh similarity between the lists that gives me an idea of what to shop for and then what i'll do is i'll do a whole month in which i do a canadian whiskeys and I'll have them on as guests. Maybe even take a trip up to Canada um, uh, and visit some distilleries. Maybe even do a meetup or something like that. But that's this still very, uh, still very, 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 very early uh, um, in the works. The challenge is, of course, is how many of those great Canadian whiskeys, if I can find some, uh, that they have their list, how many can I get here in the United States? That can be the challenge, such as a lot 40 cash strength. Anyway, so the question is, are the other distilleries, ones I don't know of, are they going to be able to be on par with Balcona's Iron Root, and particularly I'm saying, an, an Iron Root? And Ben Millam, given Heather Green is there, I have high hopes for it. Goheb says, is dissertation on that list? Well, um, probably, but... I don't remember how many other are from the same distillery. You can't have a top 10 list and they're all from the same distillery. They need to be from different distilleries. And the dissertation is probably even more difficult to get than the Lot 40 cast strength. So what am I getting on the nose? Lighter fruit notes? Some vanilla? Um, what I would say at this point is when you think of Texas, you think of a lot of heat. You think of some radical temperature fluctuations, a lot of dire, uh, you know, huge dire, diurnal range swing. Um, you think of big, bold, poof, in your face, Texas style whiskeys, right? 
at least that from that's what kind of comes to my mind, right? Bacconas are, I mean, they're fantastic whiskeys, but they are full pedal to the metal. Can you also in Texas do something light and delicate with finesse and show that Texas can do more than just uh, you know um, cowboy boots and and cowboy hats and 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 uh, shotguns and you know, uh, you know you know what I mean? It's kind of the big everything's bigger in Texas. So I actually get sort of like some Chardonnay notes on this. Little apple and pear with some vanilla. There's a little bit of a maltiness there, a little bit of a graininess, but not like a super youthful uh, whiskey. There's actually a, a slight, uh, slightly, it's kind of like a banana character. Not quite, a, it's not like a green banana, but it's not like a totally, f you know, like you get a banana turns yellow. It's not green anymore, it's not yellow. Um, and yet, you might want to give that banana just one more day. But it's ripe. It's just not super ripe, which is kind of like how they arrive at the store when you buy them. That way they don't go brown too fast when you get home. And yet, when you go to peel off the peel of the banana, it's kind of really hanging in there, you know, because you want to give them another day. I'm getting a banana kind of like that. Tom Mar said, just stop at Daniel's place. I'm sure he has every bottle you could want to sample. The problem is Daniel lives far away from everybody else. Uh, people I'd want to meet up with, uh, you know, Canada is a big state. They're all spread out. Nice. There's like a white chocolate note on the pot. And you probably get a lot of nose noises with the mic here. I always delete that on my videos. Interesting. There's some grassiness to it. Grapefruit. Oh, you know what it is? I taste beer. It tastes like a beer. Um, I'm not a beer drinker. There's, there's a hop. Now, I haven't looked this up, but I have to look it up. This tastes like a distilled beer. Um, and I, I mean a beer beer, like a fully complete beer. So let me show you something here. Hold on a second. It reminds me of this one. Wow. So Seven Stills Distillery in San Francisco is a craft um, brewery. They make beers. So they make a completed beer. Um which you can try in, side by side with the, with their whiskeys, and then they also distill that same beer. So what you get here? This is really really interesting. This is a whip nose whiskey from Seven Stills Distillery. Intense lemon lemongrass, super fruity. So they don't have to age it that long. You're not getting a lot of its a lot of its flavors aren't coming from the oak so much. Um, so it's not like hey we're flavor we make a flavored spirit that's flavored with barrel but rather a lot of the flavor comes from uh the 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 the, the uh basic uh beer and that is very similar to this and i like if you're a beer drinker you're i think you're gonna like this um so while on the nose i get that kind of white chocolate notes these tend to smell a little bit more like a, a beer uh, on the nose uh, and then they're just very intensified on, on the palate. Guy Davis says, I lived in Dallas for five years, and I missed that place. Just sorry. I was running with a crowd that was drinking vodka. Okay. Um, good times. If Mouse Mooth 6076 says, Balconas punches you in the mouth. Um, you got to approach it gently, cautiously. It does have very, very intense flavors, and some of the longest finishes – I've ever had from a whiskey coming out of Balcona's. Absolutely, they're fantastic. Charles Ashworth says, Matt said it was finished in a beer barrel. Okay. Okay. Charles Ashworth says it was finished in a beer, a beer barrel. What does that tell you about my nose and palate? In a sense, I'm doing blind. I haven't looked this up. I don't know anything about them. And yet, I'm very much just uh, 
picking up those beer characteristics. Now, there's several things I like about this. One is it's unique. They're doing a single mold. It's they're not trying to imitate Scotland or something else. They're doing something very, very, very unique, and it's for those who like um, a beer. It has nice balance. Now, you can have a young whiskey that it can be off-putting because it's too green, and that's not this. This, I get a little hoppiness to it. It definitely, I'm, as I'm talking right now, it's got a nice long finish, but it definitely, a, it tastes like a, a beer. It's really, really interesting. Whether someone likes it or not, it'd be completely subjective. I think it's well-made. I get... Some lemon, lighter lemon. I get it's it's some if you're familiar with wines, I know you know I'm gonna bring wine in. Eric Everson, thank you very much for tuning in. Saw you live and had to saw you live and had to drop in. Hope things are well. Things are going very, very, very well. And I uh, got someone else in the house who knows how to spell the name Eric for, for, for once. So if you're familiar with a Sauvignon Blanc, um Sauvignon Blanc, uh, nice summer wines, um uh, a white wine. They tend to have a grapefruit note, a grassy note, a lot of citrus to it. Part of this reminds me of a Sauvignon Blanc. But then it, really on the back end, on the finish, is where it becomes much more of, of a beer note. And I like it. And this is one, let's see, what was ABV again? 46. I would actually, with this one, like to drop the temperature just a little bit, as long as they don't lose uh, the, the flavor too much. Do I have any challenge coins left? So I currently have about 40. Um, I'm now going to be hanging on to my challenge coins. I'll be in Austin, Texas uh, in October. And sorry, I'm going to so I'm gonna save on the rest of my coins and bring bringing with me down to Austin, Texas. I will make them available in Austin, Texas. I'm going to have a, probably another 100 made uh, for that event. I'm, I'll make those available there not down in Austin, Texas. Um, and if I have leftovers from that, then I'll make those available. I just moved. If you've seen my previous videos, you notice the background is a little bit different here. Things have been moved around. I currently, if I can turn the camera around, I've got uh, a few thousand books and boxes over there. I spent earlier today, yesterday, unpacking. It's going to take me a few more weeks unpacking. They're in a box somewhere. So right now, with everything else i got going on, I'm, I'm just, even if I was to be selling them right now, I get too much going on. I'm just busy. I don't. I just don't have time for it. So sorry. I will have another series of coins coming out. Just stay tuned. Mm. Charles Ashworth asks, "How would that compare to a Glenlivet or the light floral Scotch?" Um, it has a little bit of maltiness to it, but it's there's nothing like it's nothing like Glenlivet. The only whiskey I can compare it to is this one, this this uh, Seven Stills Distillery. It's it's, it, uh, it, it's nothing like a Scotland. And I like that about it. They're not trying to imitate Scotland. It just There's nothing in Scotland that's anything like this. It's just very distinct. Um, it, this is the first time I've had a, a single mold that was like this one. I'll put this back over here. For now, I like it. All right, but I do want to want to move on to someone, something else. Um, so on to, this is the Witherspoon Straight Bourbon. The, now, going into the bourbons, um, the one concern I have about Texas is that it maintain its own identity and style. It's similar to my concern for Japan. Um, I like Japanese whiskeys. I like the main, them to maintain their identity. I did a whole weekend on Japanese whiskeys, did a video on why is there a Japanese whiskey shortage. I did a live stream with uh, Michael from Underneath the Bottle. And um, I covered in that video why there's a shortage. And one of my concerns is that because of the shortage, they'll cut corners and someone will start importing whiskeys from outside of Japan and put the label Japanese whiskey on it because the regulations are so loose, loose, excuse me, I'm kind of burping and hiccuping at the same time. Uh, and the result is the water down the brand uh, and integrity of the name Japanese whiskey. And, and that's what I don't want to go. Um, with Texas, what I don't want to see is them try to imitate uh, Kentucky 
you know, uh, which would mean if they're doing, if they're just doing a little bourbon, 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 let's do something different. Okay, please, let's do something different. One of the things I like about Iron Root is they're doing some corn whiskeys. They just released Icarus. Um, if you want to know more about that, look them up. I, I and probably want to get a bottle. Um, they're so because corn whiskey doesn't have to be a new oak. Uh, they also can bring in uh, other flavors from um, other barrels. And they're uh, the uh, Licorice Brothers are actually doing something unique stylistically in the way they're making it. They're, they went and studied in uh, Cognac region in France, and they're using a little bit of a Cognac style and approach to do some distillation. I'm going to have them on this channel in a couple weeks, and we'll get more into that at that time. So Eric Everson says he's looking forward to the uh, Balcona's Blue Corn. So there's a baby blue and there's a blue corn. I would like to try the blue corn. I like the baby blue, but I hear the blue corn is even better. Hey, Roger Flick, thank you very much for giving me a $2 chat. Slan Jiva. So right on the nose, I get more. Typically with bourbons, you know, you get that sort of intense um, corn notes. Caramel corn, caramel corn, um, not necessarily pop, pop, popcorn, um, baked corn, canned corn, cream corn, some kind of corn note. It's funny, this actually has a slight, just a very slight smoke to it, which could be come from the barrels. If you heavily charred barrels, I'm getting some vanillas. I'm going to coat the glass, turn this around a little bit. Whiskey Music says, Scotland has five main regions, yes. How many would you say are in the USA? How many would you say in the USA at this time? That's a good question. I haven't spent a whole lot of time thinking about it. The USA is too large. I, I couldn't tell you. It's just too large. Uh, I know Daniel Whittington has given that some thought. Uh, when you're talking about regions, <clears throat> what you're looking at typically – the, what the United States tends to do is look at things not just geographically, but climate, soils, uh, and consequently what styles that come out of it. Um, if you watch the video uh, uh, with uh, Spencer Whalen and I, he talks about the various regions, and the differences of the different regions within Texas. So if you haven't seen that, go back and, and, and watch that. You're going to get something different from the coast than you get from the, from the highlands, not highlands like mountains, but anyway. Um, uh, and from the panhandle because the climate's going to be some like on the coast versus inland one, you're going to get, uh, actually with age, you're going to get, uh, a proofing down being close to the ocean. And the other one, you're going to be losing water, which means your ABV is going to go up. Those are two different things, just di different influences and so forth. So I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. Daniel Pell, thank you very much for the, uh, $2. Happy whiskey day. Sanj. This is so Thomas Buck says uh, that is a tough to answer. I think Texas and the South are the only areas with enough density of accomplished distilleries. So, so really, and I hate to say this about my own state, the only distillery I would really hang my hat on right now in California is St. George Spirits. Um, did, no, I didn't, uh, Tom. No, I didn't try the rum. I did. I. Oh, wait a minute. I might have, but I don't think so. I think I was just sticking just to the whiskeys. This is really, really interesting. I'm getting a woody a woodiness, but it's like a wild brush. There's a little bit of a. There's a nice spice here. There's a slight charred wood note. A hint of smoke. Various spices. Some I can't exactly identify. It doesn't smell like your typical bourbon. I'm actually not getting the distinctive corn note. I'm getting more of a wood influence than I am the corn influence. And I would say this probably this is very similar to um, Garrison Brothers. The, the the intensity 
of the wood and extraction from the wood is so intense that the corn tip classic corn notes um aren't as big and as prominent as say some kentucky um bourbons wow the, so this is opening up more really really nice there's just a slight nice smokiness that i'm really like right, i'm gonna try it on the pot wow wow i know it doesn't help much saying well what i got on the nose is definitely on the palate there is a smokiness to it, but it's not like a peated smoke it's not like an isla smoke it almost reminds me as if and i don't know i know nothing about the production it reminds me it makes me think they may have done a filtering through a charred wood, maybe mesquite. I don't, I'm blind. I'm doing semi blind, right? I really don't know anything. I'll, I'll look them up later. There's all, almost like a, a, a sage mesquite note to it, but hmm, wow. But if you do something similar to the Lincoln County process, which is what Jack Daniels does, even if you do it with a different wood, there's a particular character you tend to get, um, and I'm not getting that. This is really, really nice. Uh, this raises my hopes for Texas. I'm going to say that right now. Because this is a really cool unique bourbon with some nice nice smokiness to it some nice spice character to it it doesn't taste anything like a kentucky bourbon or any other bourbon out from anywhere else i like the smoke to it i'm really really now i'm really really curious i want to look this one up um if someone else wants to look it up let me know again this is witherspoon straight bourbon it looks like it says part c dash three and then i can't read the rest of it uh, i think matt sent me some pictures of the bottles uh i would have to look them up hold on i may have them sorry i should have done this before i, I came on um sorry mm, da, 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 da. matt had sent me some pictures but i don't remember exactly where he sent them and i'm not seeing them here not seeing his handle on here and anyway, I'll, I'll look him up later i don't want to bore you guys with this but he had sent me some pictures of the of the bottles um which one so um this is witherspoon straight bourbon it looks like it says part c3 or something like that 54 percent alcohol by volume really really enjoying this one um and this one gives me a, a, another boost of high hopes that balcona's iron root are not a fluke they're not just, you know, it's just not like, okay, you got a couple good distilleries, but the rest of them suck. Uh, oh, it's a port finish. Oh, interesting. Well, you didn't write port finish on it. Um, oh, you know what you did? <laughs> I just can't read your handwriting. It says, okay, it's port finish. Oh, okay. Okay, awesome. All right. Um, okay, it's a port finish. All right, that explains a lot. And yet, it doesn't seem like a port. So, a port finish bourbon whiskey, typically on the back, on the back, on the finish, you get some sort of um, wine characteristics. <coughs> you get maybe even a little bit of plum. Uh, those kind of that coming off coming from from port. There's a bunch of different grapes you can use in making port, but you're talking about a fortified wine, Trega Nacional, Tinta Cow, and Tinta Ruiz uh, are some of the more commonly used uh grapes and making port um this is really 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 nice i would say, okay so now that it's it, if it's port finished or aged in port that's my next question is it port finished or has it been aged totally in port cast it can't be a straight it can't be a straight bourbon if it's if, if it's done all in bourbon cast so it's got to be finished in in uh in uh, a port cask so one of the whiskeys i had let's see here i can find it 
Uh, it's out of reach. So I have a bourbon from Napa Valley Distillery. And what you get is about three quarters port and all of a sudden, excuse me, three quarters bourbon and then port kicks in on the end. And the port is sort of separated from the bourbon notes. This is really well integrated so that it brings a completely new characteristic. Tasted blind, I wouldn't know this was finished at port. I know something's going on there. You would almost begin to wonder if it could have been sherry, um, another, of course, um, fortified wine. But, man, the smoke on this is really, really nice. There's a savoriness to it. There is a, like a spiced rub note that like a brown sugar, cinnamon, salt uh, rub that you might put on um, a tri-tip, barbecue tri-tip. I'm getting that on this as well. Thomas Buck, thank you very much for the two bucks. It says, YouTube gave me a free super chat. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks, YouTube. And thank you, Thomas Buck. Hey, everybody, if you can go to do free super chat, what the hell? Kick in two bucks. Ah, it can't hurt. Really, really nice. And so this is another distillery to go check out uh, perhaps next time I'm in uh, Texas. Hmm. Damn. Mm. I just moved. So everything's been relocated. So I, now I, I got to remember where all my whiskeys are at. Bourbons, bourbons, bourbons. This. Ugh. Need longer arms. In a sense, a little, not, it's, it doesn't taste the same. I'm trying to, if you put it into a family camp of whiskeys or bourbons, you're getting close to uh, everyone. Thank you much for joining in. Happy uh, Whiskey Day, World Whiskey Day. You're getting into this camp where you have the bourbon notes, but you kind of got this really nice, savory, spicy note. This is getting into the camp of a Joseph Magnus. Uh, and I really, really like this. Now, this is just, you know, this is just a sample. Typically, if I were to do a Sorry, my eyes itching. If I were to do a formal review, you know, I would have, if I had a whole bottle of this, I'd try it several different times, several different ways, get it past the shoulders, and then do a formal review. But um, as it is now, uh, the Witherspoon Straight Bourbon Port Cast Finish, 54% alcohol by volume, I would say at least, just at this point, I would say 90 points. 90 points. Just and that's and that's put in context of the way it's being reviewed. Um, was it just um, Eric Erickson says yes? The Joseph Magnus sounds amazing. Scotch Test Dunham Dummies did a review with the cigar malt. Yeah, I've heard about the cigar malt. That's another one I would really really like to try. This one, I mean, look at this. I just opened this a couple of months ago and it's almost gone. Uh, this is I, I absolutely love the Joseph Magnus. It was my uh, bourbon of the month for uh, uh, a top five it was number one uh, for bourbon month uh, in um, uh, March really really nice so Matt uh, everybody raise a glass to Matt the whiskey crusader thank you very much sir for giving me the samples um, doing this be able to do a virtual tour in Texas via these samples something that's not available at least that I can tell I'm gonna go online and look these up that's currently not available here. Thank you, sir, for uh, uh, giving it. Thank you very, very much. And I, I think we're scheduled for next Friday. We're going to do three Andalusia. Really, really looking forward to that. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. So the Ben Willen was interesting. I'm not a beer guy. If I was a beer guy, I would probably like it more. It was interesting. It was unique. I think it's well made, but it's not my style. It's it's not my style. Um, this is my style. I really, really like this one. And you can see, I'm going to finish this one. Mm. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Mm. Damn, that's good. Wow. And I've got another half a bottle. Um, 
It's about right here. So I'm going to finish this off air. Do a little bit of more research on that one. Man. So if you go down to Texas, you got to bring one bag for your clothes and another bag for your whiskey um, to bring stuff back. This is absolutely spectacular. Let me drink a little bit of water. Thomas Buck said, uh, you should do a collab with the Bourbon Guild at some point. Would be awesome. Uh, I sent them a text message back um, when I was doing Bourbon Month. Their basic response is, is they didn't do collabs. So you would have to tell them, hey, you should do something with Eric. Um, I've already reached out to them once. I don't chase after people. Um, I'm not desperate. Uh, it, I would I'd love to have them on, but they're doing their own thing. Uh, they actually do some. Those, uh, they're actually do some funny stuff. I stumbled across them one time. Um, they, they're actually pretty humorous um, and they're pretty hilarious. But they're kind of seem to be sticking to themselves. Uh, Doug Chris, thank you very much for uh, for, for the uh, uh, ten dollars. Happy World Whiskey Day. Drinking a baby blue because my bagona bagonas. I haven't had that much to drink. Balcona's single malt is gone. Thank you very much, sir. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, Luna or Aaron, uh, thank you very much for tuning in. Just reading comments here. Sorry. It is really hard to move on to another one. I want to spend the rest of my time on this one, but I need to move on. This is absolutely fantastic. Whiskey Crusader says you do an excellent job with your collaborations. You know, um, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, there is, I think, a skill and a gift of being a good guest. Whether you're having someone in your house, in your home, whether you're taking someone out to dinner, or whether you're doing a live stream, it's here's number. One, here's the reason why. There, I've seen some whiskey tubers. That when they they have someone on their show, they want to remain the star. To be a good guest, to, excuse me, to be a good host, you have someone at your house, you're taking someone out to dinner, is you make your guest the star. Your goal is for them to have the best time. Whether it's at a restaurant or in your house, the most comfortable just so that they have a good time. So they come away going, I had a fantastic time. If they're having a good time and I'm having a good time and, and, and you mean like you, you laugh, laugh it up a bit, right? I have never had a live stream or a, a collaboration that we didn't have busting up and joking out, right? And joking around. Right. So when I had Dan Garrison, Dan Garrison works his ass off. That is a hardworking man. He said, and he said in that live stream in that, oh, student, that, that premiere, he says, you know, if, and it's a common saying, you know, if you find a job you love that you have a passion for, you'll never work, never work another day in your life. In other words, when you hear the word work, we tend to think have negative connotations to it. And so you go, oh, I got to go to work. I got to go in the office. Uh. If you have something you're passionate about, you don't have that drudgery. So you don't mind doing it. So you're going to put in more energy into it. That's what he means. And that man is working his ass off. Um to get him on, for him to be a guest on, and to work in this, within the schedule, we had to go really late and record. He, he um, yawns like once or twice in it, and that's just because he's really, really tired. Um, and I'm really, really appreciative. Um, and so I wanted him to have the best time uh, as being a guest on my channel um, because he really went the extra mile to come on. And I met him at the distillery. Uh, I mean – He's doing, he's doing sales. He's on the road. He's at the distillery, in, interacting with people at the distillery. If you go to the distillery, you will probably run into him there uh, unless he's uh, out doing somewhere else. He's, he just, he, he, that man is Mr. Hustle, right? Uh, when, um, hey, Bill, thank you very much for uh, tuning in. Um, I, if you guys didn't see last night, uh, he did a, he had a circling round table thing where he's pulling individual bottles out. Um, I'm doing the same thing. And Bill and I both have the same problem, which is uh, Matt Whiskey Crusaders has the handwriting of a medical doctor. <laughs> it's a little challenging to read, which does not improve as you're drinking along. Anyway, so, anyway hardworking man, love having him on. 
So being uh, being collaborations, it's not just a, hey, who is a star player that can get on, and if I can get this rock star, figuratively speaking, onto my show, man, that'll get me a lot of subscribers and hits, and people will tune in. How can I use that person to advance my channel? There are people who think like that. There are people who act like that. That's and that's ladies cover your ears for saying that. And that's total bullshit, right? That's total bullshit. It's not about how can that person advance me. It's how can I be a good host to them so that they have a great time and they're comfortable here. And then consequently, so that the viewers have a good time as well. That's that that's all about how how Good collaborations. It's kind of like, you know, if you had a late night talk show host, right? Uh, Jimmy Kimmel or Jimmy uh, Fallon or or any other Jimmys that are on late at night or Conan O'Brien. The best late night talk show host on television is one who knows how to put his guests on, on, on in the spotlight and make them the star. And that's what's all, all, all about, about having a really good time. Uh, five dollars to Eric's new gigs. Uh, thank you much, uh, Bill, for the five bucks. Um... Whiskey Crusader says, next time, Matt, I'm just pulling your leg. I'm just messing with you. I thank you for the efforts. I thank you for the for the bottles. Um, hey, Spencer, thank you much for two bucks. He says, cheers from, from Texas. Anyhow, uh, so uh, I'm going to put this on the list. Witherspoon, another one to check out, you know, along with Balcones. Um, and, I, yeah, def, yeah, I want to visit Ben Millam, uh, but this isn't my style. But this Witherspoon – Man, this is freaking awesome. This is some really, really good stuff. Um, and it's distinct from Kentucky. It is a distinctive style. It's really flavorful. Um, it has a lot of complexity to it. I really, really like it. <laughs> By the way, uh, me saying that Matt's handwriting sucks is like the pot calling the kettle black. I do not have good handwriting, okay? I print. I don't handwrite or script. I print in order to make be legible. I've been just doing prints. You can read my handwriting. Uh, since I was in the junior high school. All righty. We're, now we're going to get into, oh, another bit. Oh, oh okay. Oh, hold on. You know, I screwed up. I screwed up. The, I, screw, I, I got confused. This is the Ben Millen. This was the Herman Marshall. I screwed up. So if you've been watching this, the first thing I did was not Ben Millen. Because that was the first one I poured. That's how I got stuck in my head. This was a Herman Marshall temptress. Herman Marshall. So this is the Herman Marshall temptress. Okay. This one is the Ben Millam. So Donna Pass says, which Texas single malt impressed you the most? Um, I was only there for a few days. I, From what I was able to try, I loved uh, the Hechiceros from Balcones, which I tasted with. Oops. I just kicked a table. Uh, which I tried with uh, Daniel Weddington. Uh, it was no longer available. It might have been in some shop somewhere in Texas, um, but that was my favorite out of all the ones that I tried. Um, Milam? Okay, Ben Milam. Ben Milam. Um, by the way, Spencer, I'm not the best one for pronunciations. Just I, I say, People say McCallan. I say McCallan. And I say McCallan because there's two L's. You call on the form. I don't say California. I say California. It's got one L. I say call on the phone. So I say McCollin. It's got two L in it. And then everybody gets their panties in a wad. We have Ben Milam. Ben Milam. People pronounce it how they want. Unless it's French wine. No, I mispronounce French as well. Um, I have a video on... Uh, uh, sparkling wine, it's probably around 15,000 watts. It's basically my notes on slides. It's pur purely for studying on my, on my wine channel. And people say, wow, great slides, but his pronunciation of French sucks. Yeah, I agree. Uh, my pronunciation isn't good. Uh, Santa Cruz, thank you very much for 10 bucks. Man, I'm getting a lot of super chats tonight. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, Luna says, screwing up, uh, screwing up is a great thing. And tasting, I mix up a Jura 18 with a Little Mill 27. Um, Zach Andrews, did you get to try the Balcones Brujeria or Brujeria? B R U J E R I. I think so at the distillery. 
but I mainly was focusing on their core range when I was there. Hmm. Hmm. I'm gonna drink some more water. Hold on, I'm gonna come back to this one. Interesting. So again, it doesn't smell like it's from Kentucky. Oh, no wonder it's a rye. God, man, I, you know, trying to watch a chat and pay attention to what you're doing here, it's easy to get confused. I was like, this doesn't remind me of a bourbon. It seems so different. And yeah, because it's not, it's not a bourbon. It's a rye. God. See, I poured this one first and then I went back this direction. And that's why I got screwed up. So I poured here, I poured here, poured here. And then tasting wise, I went back this direction. And so when I, because I, I started here, I got it confused with, <laughs> at least the distillery, with this one. And that's how I got that screwed up. Um, at least I got this one right. I didn't get that one screwed up. So this is a rye. So typical to rye. It's a straight rye. Okay, so it means 51% or more. Typically, I get like licorice. Uh, on the back end, anise. Sometimes I get this sort of root beer, uh, sarsaparilla notes. Uh, Santa Cruz says, have you found a shop in the valley that has a decent selection of Balcanas, the higher proof ones? In the Silicon Valley, no. Uh, this area sucks for whiskey shops. There's no whiskey bar. I was just complaining about this to someone else. The Silicon Valley is the brains and the heart of technology, not only from the United States, but really for the world. There is money flowing here like a river. There's tons of money here. And there ain't one freaking sing single whiskey bar here. There's a few wine bars that are, eh, there's no whiskey bars. To go find a whiskey bar, you got to go up to San Francisco, and then there's only three of them. And believe it, and that's an hour north from here. And I don't hang out there. I can't believe, and we have the Whiskey Fest. And we have um, um, Whiskeys of the World events here, and they sell out months in advance, which tells me there is a whiskey community here hiding somewhere, people who like whiskey. But uh, why don't we have a whiskey bar? Uh, if I was going to start a business, and I'm not going to try to – all the, the legal parts and all that kind of crap you got to deal with to try to start a business, I would really look into um, starting a whiskey bar or a restaurant. So Scott and Bart just did um, – a review of McCollin lineup uh, at the uh, Sirloin and Scotch restaurant there in um, Wichita, Kansas. And we were there, uh, Tom R. and I were there um, for the fifth anniversary. Uh, Tom, you were there, right? Or did we meet up at the Scotch Four Dummies? Sorry, my memory's going. Uh, um, anyway, so. The, the restaurant's not finished. Anyway, um, and they have a fantastic, you know, bar menu there and scotch and all that stuff. In Wichita, Kansas, w economically, Wichita's nothing in comparison to this area. So why do they have a place like that and we don't? It's just not fair. Uh, Goab says, I thought Silicon Valley was the world capital for breast augmentation. No, that would be Beverly Hills and Hollywood, uh, even though we have the word Silicon uh in, in our all right so we that's right we met up at the scotch for i met hoyt hemphill i met hoyt hemphill um at the scotch says dummies and you and i met up at the scotch for dummies right <sighs> hmm it's real silky. It's real smooth. But it doesn't have a lot of complexity to it. It has, in the mid it definitely has, it has that kind of root beer, sarsaparilla note. It doesn't definitely has the anise black licorice note on the back end, but it's not sort of like in your face. It's all right. Um, I'm not thrilled with it. 
I'm not a big rye drinker. I don't have a lot of exposure uh, with rye, but I'm not. It's not bad. I'm just not loving it. Mm. Alrighty, so I'm gonna go back and finish up, finish up the rest of this one. The winner of tonight is the Witherspoon Straight Bourbon Port Cask Finished, 54% alcohol by volume. Uh, at least, at least 90 points. At least, if I had a full bottle and could spend more time with it, it might even go higher. Um, so this is the one to uh, look out for. No disrespect in the other two. They're very, very, very fine. But this is definitely the star of the show. Nice color on this as well. If you can see that, it's kind of like a reddish root beer color. It's also the darkest of the three as well. Not that that matters so much. Um, but it's got a real nice color on it as well. Wow. Moist Crusader says, I'll let them know. Cool. This is, and this is just really, really, really nice. Uh just I, out of curiosity, Matt, if you could tell me how much does this cost? Um, what would I price this at? I would guess ninety-five bucks, if if not more. At least you know you. I would say it's getting got to be close to hundred bucks. This is just really, really, really nice. So the Joseph Magnus typically sells for a hundred. I happened to get a really good deal on it. I paid eighty. Some people didn't like it. I don't know why. Some people were paying 125 for it and were complaining about the price. I happened to get a good, I should have bought more of them for, but I, you know, I didn't know. They only had five of them. They're probably all gone at that price. Uh, isn't there a town in California where they make all the adult movies? Yeah, it's called Hollywood. Hollywood. And yeah, there's another place. It's, uh, it's in the southern end of the Central Valley, uh, the Central Valley. You get closer to Los Angeles. That's out in Southern California. Wow. Absolutely freaking phenomenal. I would try more. Well, but I don't have any more clean glasses. There's a lot here to go through. Here's another, here's another Ben Millum. Cooper Family Rye. I'm not a big rye guy. I mean, I'm glad I tried that one. But I'm not a big I'm not a big rye guy. Here's a Hermes Herman Marshall. Right now, what I'm looking for is to see if there's another Witherspoon. Because I really, really like that one. Sorry. 1876 Texas Straight Bourbon. Man. That one I cannot read. It says blah, 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 blah. oh, a Witherspoon. Oh. Here's another one. Witherspoon Straight Bourbon Single Barrel Reserve. Ooh. 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 Okay, I got to try that one. So I got to try that one. I got to get me, see if I can get me another glass. Hold on just a second. I'm going to get me another glass. Another Witherspoon. We'll turn this into Witherspoon night. Just, I'll be back in just a second. Got to get me another glass. I was not planning on this. All righty. Here we go. Super curious. I gotta try this one. Oh, oh, oh. Man. Witherspoon is another one to keep your eye out for. Witherspoon straight bourbon single barrel res I think it says reserve. 50%. Like, I think like 50% ABV. Yes. Um So I like so this one. I kind of wish try this one first, and then this one. Cause you want to try straight bourbon, and then try straight bourbon port finished. So you can see what so my guess is. This might be this, but finished in port. It's a guess. I don't know. It's a little lighter in color, you know, because I hadn't spent any time in a port cask. <sighs> wow. Ah, uh, so what Crusader says correct. <laughs> Eric is famous. He says, I'm famous for my Christmas eggnog misses. Yeah, I did a whole episode on that. It was interesting. They also make a sherry cast finish. Ooh, that, man. So I'm really, ooh. I'm getting, so this is a little more classic. This I get cherry. Almost like a mar maraschino cherry. Cherry pie. In fact, I'm getting more 
cherry on this, and I think I've ever have off another bourbon. Nice vanilla. Still not getting like major corn notes. Some vanilla, cinnamon, a little fresh wood, fresh oak. Sort of a vanilla pudding, tapioca on the palate. Mm. Real silky. Just glides across the palate. No bite. It's at 50 ABV, but there's no like bite or tinge. Real silky. Palette wise, in terms of the way it sits on your palate, it actually feels light for a bourbon. So it doesn't feel super viscous. It's nice, but it's nice. You know, I'd go 87 points, 88, but the, 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 the steal of the show definitely it definitely is uh, the podcast finish. That is the one to look, uh, definitely look out for. Just look and see if they got any other weather spoons in here. Nope, that's it. All right. All right, so we've been going for an hour and 11 minutes. I'll give it another five minutes or so. I'm going to wrap it up. It'll be time for uh, dinner. So uh, currently working on a 17-day course or 17, 17 videos on the history of Scotch whiskey. Um, there'll be a video every single day, 17 days straight. So, and this will be starting in June. So almost thinking like you're going to summer school. And we're going to go for 17 days straight. I'm going to try to keep them entertaining, um, imaginative, creative. I will also, also be doing a whiskey with each one. So it's not just, and today, and then he went here, and then in 1738, blah, blah, blah. It's not going to be like that at all. Um, I'm going to try to make it interesting because... This is my personal study for preparation and going to the Edinburgh Whiskey, Whiskey Academy and getting the diploma um, uh, on single malt scotch. And it'll be part of my exam, so I need to memorize all this stuff. After that, there'll be 17 days on whiskey business. Um, that's also for the course, and that'll start um, probably June 18th, and that'll go all the way up to July 4th, when I take off for Scotland, I'll then be in Scotland from or London and then Scotland from July 4th through July 20th. When I come back, I will finish up the rest of July uh, with um, probably almost every day. Um, I'll be doing videos on deductive tasting, essentially taking what I've learned as a sommelier, as a wine sommelier. And over the last three years, I have sort of migrated there, there are differences in how you approach a whiskey than how you approach a wine um, but there are some skills that carry over and i want to do it particularly um for people who are new um not only for people who are new to whiskey but also to how to help you help uh, introduce whiskey to other people um i disagree with the approaches hey you don't like it just keep drinking eventually you'll start to like it why would you do that to anyone? Why would you do it to yourself? Why would you? I just don't, I don't believe in doing that. You know, we, people do that with kids. You know, you don't like broccoli. Just keep eating broccoli. Just in, now I, I can understand you want, you need to get your kids to eat vegetables, right? So kids, maybe all they want to eat is candy. So I understand that, but you do, there's no, there's no moral imperative or cultural necessity to drink whiskey. If you don't like it, you don't like it. But I think you can introduce people to whiskey who at first approach don't like it in a way that isn't just, hey, just cram this down your gullet until your throat is numb, and then eventually you'll start to like it. 
it, you know, I, I'm going to get crude here. I'm going to get crude here. I'm going to get crude here. So, ladies, forgive me. It's not like saying, hey, yeah, anal sex is painful, but, hey, just let me keep cramming it in there, and eventually you'll get used to it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know that was crass and crude. But, 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 but approaching whiskey shouldn't be like that. That's not how you approach. Not that I wouldn't know anything about that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> that's not how you should be approaching approaching whiskeys. You know, uh, you should approach it delicately. Uh, and there are reasons why people are confused. There are reasons why people senses overwhelm. There's reasons why people. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I've had a few to drink. So <laughs> anyway, uh, so <laughs> anyway. Um, there's reasons why people have those problems and and you just got to approach it differently. You know, um, I'm my thankful one that my parents never force fed me to eat anything or force me to play the piano or force me to do things. We got introduced to things that we got introduced as things so that you would like music so that you would like vegetables so that you would like things Rather than I have to eat this because my parents are forcing me to eat it and I can't leave the dinner table until I do or, um, you know, I can't have my dessert until I eat these things. My parents didn't do that. Like I really like the way my parents weren't perfect. But one of the things that did do right is introduce vegetables to us in a way that we can like them. And it wasn't by smothering it in cheese sauce uh, as some other people do. Anyway. Anyway. So, all right. So the winner of the night is the one to go by is uh, look it up. See if it's, if it's in your area. Um, if you're in Texas, is again the Witherspoon Straight Bourbon. Anyway, so that's going to finish up uh, July as I'll do things on intensive uh, and yet basic. I'm gonna, it'll be intensive. It'll be detailed, uh, and yet it'll also be basic enough that I think anybody will be able to get some out of it. And if you already know how to taste and analyze whiskeys, um, I think I'll give you better skills and how to. Um, Introduce whiskey to other people as well. So being a sommelier is not about showing off knowledge. It's about being a servant. And it's about uh, your guest having a great time. See, there's some people who become sommeliers and they get their heads full of knowledge and they have all kinds of pins and certifications or whatever. And then it becomes, information becomes a weapon to beat it over someone else, to, over uh, someone else's head because, hey, you don't know how much I know. I am a this and I'm a that. And that's bullshit, Right. It's all about how can you now serve other people um, so that they have a really good time at a restaurant, a really good time at your whiskey bar, a really good time at your home, uh, and how to introduce them so that they don't feel stupid, that, but they feel like they're really excited and being uh, introduced to whiskey or wine or food and wine pairing. Food and wine pairing can be very intimidating. You know, when you want to have a party and you want everybody to have a good party, Man, I don't know what wine should I get with this food, and we're serving this. And people, we're having a potluck. Everybody's bringing food over. How you know everybody's bringing something different? How am I going to know what wines to serve? Da, 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 da. You know, people get stressed out over that, right? So teaching people about food and wine pairing is about making it fun, making it easy, and taking the stress out of it, so they can relax and have a good time. Focus on having a party. Same thing with uh, whiskeys as well. Um, uh, so, Tom says, Parson Mark, keep going. All right, I'll, I'll keep going, but I do want I am getting a little hungry. Doug Crisp says, I go back to whiskeys I don't like at first because I know a new experience and strange new thing. I do it myself, not a big deal. Okay. Uh, Thomas Buck says, Encore, Encore. Um, <laughs> uh, Eric Everson says, Now you should pour that compass box to your left as <laughs> staring at me. Uh, which one? Um, that one, the extravaganza. No, this is Texas month. I'm sticking to Texas. I mean, that's a phenomenal whiskey. Uh, the pro I have, and then I have a spice tree here. I have um, a no name there. I couldn't put these on the same shelf because that because that is so tall. And I actually have some others down here. The, the, some bottles are whatever too tall. So I got some down there as well. Tamar says, time for haggis in the microwave. There, there you go. By the way, I heard Scott and Bart uh, from Scotland had some haggis. Kind of curious to hear what their take is on it. Mm. Man. 
See, here's the problem with this one is this is so good. This is a whiskey. You sip it and you taste it. And you, you, you feel like you should be silent. But I can't do this on, on, on a, this. You should sit and go, just savor it. The length, I'm still tasting it now. The length of, of this is so good. The development, the complexity, the I'm still tasting it now as I'm talking now. This is a one you don't say wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. May I have another, right? This is one you just savor uh, for a long period of time. This is, I mean, I'm the point score that I would give it is just going up. Um, anyway, hey, Matt, thank you very much for the whiskeys. Thank you very much for tuning in. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you for helping me interpret uh, and translate your handwriting. And I look forward to uh, uh, when we do a live stream, which we do the Andalusia, I think it's next Friday. That'd be awesome. So Thomas Buck says, I'm an, a compass box and Amroot fanboy. Uh, what's good? So speaking of Amroot, so I actually have four or five bottle, uh, bottles of the intermediate sherry cask of Amroot. It goes for about $120. I got them for $50 each, so I bought as many as I could. But that's a phenomenal sherry bomb. That's a great one as well. It's really, really nice stuff. Hmm. Alrighty. Wow. Really, really, really nice. I'm going to see if they ship. The, so this is another problem with a challenge with Texas. The laws there are kind of funky. You can't, you can buy wine and beer on a Sunday. You can't buy whiskey on a Sunday. Like that makes no freaking sense. Um, and then they have shipping problems where they can't just sh ship. I think it's if I, it's they're probably a three tier system where they have to go distributor. So some states have a three tier. Basically, the produce you have the producer, distributor, then retailer, and the producer can't sell straight to a retailer or straight to the customer. They have to go through distributors. Um, so they're kind of and so if you have super low production, um, you're real, real, real small. You're not going to bother with that because larger chain stores. They want to buy whiskey by the pallet, not by the case. Uh, a lot of times, particularly if you're selling, selling, selling overseas. Mm. All righty. So I'm going to wrap this up. I want to thank you very much. So I've got two more videos coming out from um, Garrison Brothers. It's the um, single barrel. And the best is the Estacado. Speaking of port finished, um, so this was port finished. Th this is this will be the third one I do. This was my favorite, um, and it's it's different than this one, even though they're both port finished. So this comes from a local the port cast they got. They did a swap of cast with um, a, a Texas winery that made a port, a uh, sort of fortified wine, and so they then uh, aged this um, in. Uh, a, a a port style wine cask. This one maintains, I would say, the fruit character, um, the wine character of it, whereas this goes over into the savory notes. Both of them really, really uh, delicious, but very, 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 very different. Alrighty. So hey, um, thank you much for everyone for uh, joining in. If you watch this on the replay, thank you very much. And if you're looking for something for shop, I not said it a gazillion times already. Just highly, highly impressed with the Witherspoon straight bourbon uh, port cast bottled at 54% alcohol by volume. I um, hope you have a great Sunday and uh, the rest of the week. All right. Cheers.